Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered whether or not the data you're collecting is trustworthy and should be listened to? That's what we'll talk about today. One person's data is another person's noise. Casey Cole. Last week, we talked about how you can have an idea about gathering and managing data. And this time, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can ensure that the data you are collecting is good data. So what was interesting is the first standard we're going to talk about is called TARP, which is an acronym you find on most academic websites, libraries, many law libraries that are out there because they're looking for data integrity when someone's doing research. You don't want to go into a case with great data that came from a terrible source. It stands for timeliness, authority, accuracy, relevance, and purpose. What is it there for? But when I researched it and I looked at all these different libraries, I noticed that all the libraries had these standards. But some of them called them by different names, which made me curious about how the standard came about. Some of the other names I found for it was TRAP, CRAB, and even CRAP. Where did this all come from? And as it came out, this was a method created by Sarah Blakesley, and she was a librarian at the University of California, Chico, and she was trying to give them a standard of how they could find good data, create awesome research, and use information in a wise way. She didn't really have a name for it. She didn't know what she was even going to call it. So she wrote this paper and a previous semester to it, she was handing this out to all the students. And one student said to her, did you know this spells crap? And she said since that time, she has been using the acronym crap. So instead of trap, which was timeliness, the C in crap ended up being currency, which is exactly the same thing as timeliness. And some people just decided to change the letter because they didn't want to have a standard called crap. But she says that there's two time periods in her life. There's BC, which is before crap, and then the era of crap. And I thought that was a great story. And I'm glad she leaned into it and didn't hide from the fact that a well-used idea that she came up with is called crap. And it makes sense because when you have bad data, what do you have? Because I recorded this podcast before looking up how this idea ever came about and all the great work that was done to create the crap method, I followed the order of the tart method. And some of the names are a little bit different based on where I found them. First of all, it's timeliness, which means how long ago was this written? When was the viewpoint taken? Because chances are too, the person who wrote that article was also using research that was done before the article. That can really date an article, a blog post, a podcast pretty severely if not only is the article old, but the data that the person was using was older than the article. Sometimes things are timeless and they always are valuable and sometimes they age. So it's important. Then A is the authority of the author. Do they have something in them, whether it's professional work, whether it's educational work, whether it's research that they've done that allows them to have expertise in this topic. Does their article have footnotes? That's a really important one. I was listening to an author of a help book being interviewed and he said, well, I noticed that you have no footnotes in your book. Are all these ideas that you have about diet and weight loss and eating from science? And she goes, oh, yes. Not only is this from science and from our personal experience as people who get paid to help people lose weight, but we did not want to clutter this book with all sorts of footnotes, references, and other details about where we got this information. I think if you have footnotes, if you have references, if you have some sort of history or science or detail that's backing you up, you put it in a book. You're not worried about cluttering it up because there's ways in publishing to make it not clutter up your book. And so the second A stands for accuracy. Is the information good? 
Can you rely on it? Do you find it to be truthful? Does it seem to be backed up with research? It's the basic question of where's the information from? Was it peer reviewed? Was it looked at at all? Was there, you know, was there an editor who reviewed the information? And the writing itself seems to be bias free. So accuracy is a huge part of this. All the other parts are right. The person has the authority to write this. It's relevant. It's current. But it's not accurate. Then you won't be able to trust the data at all. Relevance. Is the information related to what you're talking about? Related to the aspect you're talking about? Is it important to whatever piece you're working on? Your thesis? Your podcast? How relevant is it? And then the last one is P for perspective, which means, is this person biased in a way? Is their viewpoint not allowing them to see all the truth that's involved in here? Are they biased? Are they giving their opinion in a biased way? And keep in mind, too, that bias isn't always, well, I believe blah, 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 and that other thing is wrong. That is one kind of bias, but the other part of bias is just leaving out the other side's entire viewpoint. It's not even there. And that one's a harder one to figure out whether or not you're doing. Some other indications about whether or not your resource is any good has to do with the quality of it. You know, if there are a lot of mistakes in it, there's data that's completely wrong. If maybe there's grammatical errors, punctuation, if someone is trying to write a blog and there's some substantial quality errors with that blog, it may be a warning sign. It may be a good way of seeing whether or not people's articles are worthwhile. Then the other question is, is whether or not the person is advertising. Is the person trying to get you to buy a vitamin and all they do are podcasts about how great this vitamin is? Then it may be a sign of what kind of bias they have. You know, and then it's always important, too, to check maybe some of the articles that that site, that person refers to, to see if they aren't going to another location or a place. I remember a long time ago, I was doing some research about weather apps and whether they're spying on you. And I had a particular favorite in my list of apps about weather. And I thought, these people, they're great. They really have everything together. And I went to their homepage And it really didn't have much there. And then I found out who owned them. So I went to the owner's website and it turns out they are a data marketing company. So they were taking all the data that was coming from people using this app, selling it, and then selling it to somebody else. So while the weather data was very nicely formatted, they were ransacking almost everything that you looked at in their app including detailed location information, and using it to sell to you. And also never saying a word about it. So it was pretty deceiving, and I was pretty disappointed in this company. And no longer use that weather app that used to be my favorite. Making sure you know who owns someone, who owns the website that they're doing, whether they're a credible person writing this, all important types of pieces of information that you can use is don't gather information that is going to become quickly old. I store a lot of data. I have everything from one notebooks to Notion databases and all sorts of other ways I collect data. The one thing I never do is I never collect data that is going to age rapidly because I can decide, for example, that I was going to do a podcast episode about the role of serotonin and cortisol and all the other types of chemicals in our brain that affects our behavior. However, the brain science is something that is so fast changing. I never bothered to collect articles about this particular topic until I was just about to do that episode because it's going to age. It's not going to be accurate, maybe even within six months. Then keeping track of What kinds of data you want to collect and which ones you will collect at the moment you're going to use the data also becomes an important tip. Who is the audience of this particular resource that you're looking at? Was it meant for fun? 
Was it meant for children? Was it meant for college students or PhD research? Knowing what the audience is for whatever particular type of resource you have is important. When you're looking at this data, there's some important key aspects you have to take a look at. First of all, is this resource that you're looking at on the topic that you're trying to provide information about? Is it something that's on the right target? If I were going to write an article about how the brain processes chemicals, but if the book actually talked about a productivity tip and really never got to the core functionality about how the brain processes information on a chemical scale, it didn't really hit the topic. So making sure that your resource is the right topic is important. And then the next step is figuring out if this particular resource is good for your audience. For example, one of the podcasts I'm going to be doing with my friend down the road is about citizen science, about things that you can walk outside your door and see in the world around you. But if I bought a book that talked about how stars formed in the universe or why frogs are green, maybe that detail is not the right for the audience because the audience is going to be basically non-scientists who are interested in going outside their door and seeing a frog. Knowing the chemical interactions about how the frog became green would be outside the scope of my audience. It's not really what I'm trying to achieve. So maybe it's a great book, but it's not the right audience for the purposes I have. You also want to make sure that someone doesn't have an agenda. There may be very good pieces of work out there, but they're trying to drive you to a point. And so while what they may be saying is not a lie, it may be part of the story. You have to be very careful about what type of agenda people have. And it's not even that you can't use articles or information from people with an agenda as long as you understand that's what they're doing. And then you spend some time trying to read people with maybe the opposite agenda so that you get a full picture about what it is that's being said. Then when you're gathering the data, you want to make sure that it's actionable, that it adds value to whatever it is you're trying to do. You want to make sure that it follows in on this grid, which is usually low value, high value, low truth, high truth. Obviously, we want to have high value, high truth details that are out there. Then you want to make sure that the data that you're collecting is useful for the format that you're trying to do. For example, maybe some information is great for a poster or in my digital picture frame or on a post-it note that I can put next to my monitor. But if I'm doing a podcast that lasts about 17 minutes, maybe it's not enough or it's not valuable in that format. I can't tell you how many times I've listened to podcasts where they'll say, well, and so then there's this line that comes in from the right and then up to the bottom. And I like, guess a podcast. We're not watching what you're doing. It is really hard for us to imagine exactly what you're talking about because you are showing a picture on a podcast. And some people are particularly good at that, but you're supposed to be telling a story on a podcast. So it's important that that data, whatever data you're gathering is for the right format that you're hoping to present this data in. Then the next step is that you want to develop an action plan around the data, how you're going to use it, how you're going to produce it. If you were writing a paper, is it a 10 page paper or a three page paper? If it's a podcast, is it a three hour discussion on the purposes of serotonin in your brain? Or is it a 17 minute overview on the various chemicals that exist in your brain? When you have that plan in place, you'll know exactly what it is you're supposed to do with that data. So my challenge to you is take a hard look about whether or not you're using good sources. And then in the future, can you think about this crap or trap method of analyzing your data and making sure that your data is timely, accurate, it has authority, meaning coming from good sources, that it's relevant to what you're trying to study. And there's a real purpose to this data. 
It actually fits the format you're trying to do. And it has a purpose for existing. The purpose matches your purpose. And take a look to see if you're using good resources when it comes to finding data. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you being out there. Please remember to leave a review on whatever type of app you're using. And I really love sharing more information to more people. And always remember that you can get quality data and ensure that you're not being biased in any sort of way by taking small steps.